Uh, today's webinar is entitled Introduction to Green Engineering. Our speakers today are three experts in the area of green engineering. Uh, Julie Zimmerman, who is at Yale University, an Associate Professor of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at Yale University. Matthew Eckelman, an Assistant Professor of, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Northeastern. And Julie Shonung, who is a Professor and Vice Chair of Chemical Engineering and Material Sciences at the University of California at Davis. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Julie Zimmerman from Yale University. Julie, uh, hopefully you are in control of the slides right now and welcome today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk um, as a brief uh, overview and introduction to green engineering. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is the importance of green engineering. And this has a lot to do with we're all trying to solve sustainability challenges, be it from a green chemistry perspective or at a higher um, process or system basis to think about how do we solve today's sustainability challenges without creating additional environmental problems or social problems in the future. So the first example I'm going to put up is purifying water. So in the background of that picture, you see the Capitol building in Washington, Washington D.C., and that is a tanker car of chlorine that goes by, till this day, the Capitol building three times a week to go to the uh, Blue Plains Drinking Water Treatment Plant to provide drinking water to the nation's capital. And just starting to think about the amount of resources that go into ensuring security and safety of that tanker car as it's going through this very populated and important um, location. And we do need to provide clean, safe drinking water, but is this the wrong way to get to the right thing that we're trying to do? Is there a greener way to provide clean, safe drinking water? So here's another example. The state of California is focused very heavily on growing um, the economy. They're using photovoltaics. One of the ways the industry is growing, as the state reported has just come out, is the use of precious, rare, and toxic metals to develop these solar cells. And again, the goal here is to address climate and move towards renewable energy with a lower uh, carbon footprint for the energy generated and distributed. But is this really a sustainable solution going forward if we're relying on these resources that maybe are not available to go to scale or are toxic and that we're taking them out of the Earth's crust and then distributing them into um, engineered systems and ultimately the environment. Another example everyone, again, is pretty familiar with is, you know, we have this um, right thing to do in terms of providing um, increased food production, but is the way we want to do that through the use of pesticides that have been shown to be persistent and cause harm to other species than the ones we're targeting? Is there a better way to do this right thing that would avoid the use of these kinds of chemicals? Here's an example I'm going to go through really briefly, and um, Professor Eckelman will spend more time in a bit, but one of the um, bits of the Energy Security Act in the U.S. that came out in 2007 talked about trying to achieve some energy efficiency through enhanced lighting technology, such as compact fluorescence. Turns out every one of these compact fluorescent light bulbs has a little bit of mercury, which is a neurotoxin contained with it, within them. And again, here we're trying to solve a carbon goal in terms of climate, but is this the way we want to do it, using a neurotoxin that's now embedded in products and distributed into individual users' homes? So how did we get there? These are all urgent and necessary challenges, whether it's water purification or food production or energy um, efficiency. They're often exciting in science and technology, but the best of intentions. But the way we're getting there is we're playing this carnival game called whack-a-mole. We have a climate problem, we knock that mole down, and another one pops up, whether it's toxic chemicals or the energy water nexus. And so as we're developing these solutions, we often have cascading and unintended consequences in other resource categories as we try to address sustainability. And the argument here is we really need to think very broadly about the system and consider multiple endpoints at once using something more like a five-headed hammer to go after the moles that we're trying to address for sustainability. And this is where green chemistry and green engineering come in. So this is really a new approach. It's about innovation. It's about not incrementally improving what we have today, but thinking about how we want the system to function. We want to provide clean, safe drinking water, 
what's the best way to do it rather than how do we provide more enhanced security to get that chlorine delivered to the drinking water treatment plant. It's important that this um, approach advances competitiveness, so busting this myth that environment and economic growth are necessarily um, in competition. And so how do we ensure that the solutions we're coming up with also have economic benefits? Something the green chemistry community is very familiar with is moving these solutions towards inherent or intrinsic rather than trying to control the circumstances. And then using uh, systems approaches to do this, again, that side-headed hammer and the whack-a-mole game. So there's lots of definitions of sustainability out there. Um, this is one that I like that came out in 2003, and I like it because the second word in the definition talks about design. So all of a sudden, instead of talking about these nebulous um, goals of future generations, we can start to think as chemists and engineers and what we can do, what is it that we do? It's designing new molecules, new processes, new products, and new systems. And here we have pretty clear goals that we're trying to um, address as we're designing this function into our products. This is really a necessary change in what, how we think about engineering design. So I'm harping on the word design, and there's a reason for that. I'm putting up a figure that's very common for engineering design process. On your x-axis, you have a design timeline from concept to testing and finally into production. And then on the y-axis, it's the scale of percentage. And what you see is that the design phase, you commit 70% of the cost, although you won't actually incur those costs until you go into process planning and production. The same thing is true here for environmental impacts. As soon as we design that system, whether it's the feedstocks we're going to use um, or the process that we're going to use, we're also designing the waste stream and the energy demand of that system. So by getting involved at the design phase, we have the most potential to affect the outcome long before we go into production and realize those costs. I would also argue it's not just how you design, but what you design. So I'm going to put up another figure here. Um, the x-axis here is investments, whether it's time, money, resources, or energy. And on the y-axis is the potential realized benefits from those investments. So the first solutions that we can go for the um, amount of investment we make is an incremental solution. So I'm going to use uh, transportation just as an um, accessible example here. And this is how do we, how do we make our um, – Gas-powered cars a little bit more efficient. What can we do with material light weighting? What can we do with aerodynamics? How do we get a little bit more efficiency out of that car? The second example from that would be re-engineering the system, and this is starting to look at plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, um, the Tesla. So we're not incrementally tweaking the existing car, but wholesale redesigning this personal mobile transportation system. But the place where we can actually realize the most benefit for our investment is to redefine the problem. And if we start thinking about the function that that car might serve, it's really access to goods and services. And by redefining the problem is, what's the most sustainable way to provide access to those goods and services? We might come up with a solution that's not a car at all and might, in fact, be more sustainable. Maybe it's something around telecommuting or public transportation. So by starting to think about the problems we're um, trying to address at the broadest scale and thinking about the function of the system rather than defining a product and a solution a priori, we have the most opportunity to realize benefits from the work we're doing. And then this really, as we talk about Tesla or these really disruptive innovations, is how do we get off this trail of incremental improvements, being a little bit less bad, doing a little bit more with a little bit less Stuff. So, again, sustainability without this idea of innovation is really unsustainable. We can't get there with what's on the shelf today, so we need these new solutions. And innovation without a sustainability framework can also be unsustainable because we can come up with great new designs, but if they don't take into account environmental, social, or economic considerations, they're going to wind up in this example of doing the right things, but maybe in the wrong way. So thinking about transformative innovation, one great tool for doing this that's used a lot in green engineering is biomimicry. So there you have a photograph of a gecko on a ceiling in a hotel room in Mexico, which is another story. But 
you know, the question is how is that gecko stuck to the ceiling? Is it um, through an adhesive, through some kind of molecular um, chemical that's on the gecko feet? And it turns out that if you look at um, the gecko feet under a microscope, what you see is lots of these nanostructured um, fibers that are on the gecko's feet. And it turns out that adhesion, that function of adhesion, is actually provided through van der Waals forces. And that's how the gecko is able to move up walls and um, walk across ceilings. So we're getting the function of adhesion without the adhesive. And that would be, again, redefining the problem. We're not trying to make a greener adhesive. We're trying to get the function of adhesion in what's the most sustainable way possible. So this led, of course, to 3M coming out with their gecko tape and that Spider-Man hanging off the ceiling using their new product. Um, we see this a lot. If you think about a peacock, um, how many pigments are used to, pr to produce this brilliant color that we see in a peacock feather, and it turns out there are actually no pigments. Um, this is all about optical interference in a surface structure of the feather. We're getting the function of color without um, trying to make a greener chemical to achieve that goal. If we think about how pigments are, are made and, and the issues that we currently have, right, so here's again that um, uh, market stand in Mexico selling all these brilliantly colored things and the number of pigments used here are in the tens of thousands. Um, many of them are toxic and there's lots of concerns about um, long-term uh, legacy issues, including wastewater coming out of these dying facilities. Here's another example that, that shows biomimicry. Um, so an abalone shell is twice as hard as high-tech ceramics, but behaves like a metal under stress. Very interesting to the aerospace industry. The way we make ceramics right now is called, you know, beat it, bake it at very, very high temperatures for very long periods of time. And so, in order to impart the function we're interested in ceramics, we're going through very um, robust engineering processes in terms of the energy that we're demanding to realize these properties. If you look at an abalone shell under um, a microscope, you'll see that on the left. And it turns out there's some spaces that are left in the structure of the abalone shell that actually give it some of the behavior we're interested in, like behaving like a metal under stress. GE was able to replicate this abalone structure in part, but those spaces are missing. And so we're getting ceramic function, but not these other attributes that we're interested in. Even more interesting to think about how the abalone shell is made, right? Here's the abalone ceramic factory. It's not beating uh, clay and heating it to very high temperatures for a long time. It's at ambient temperature and pressure using locally available resources and materials and solar energy. Okay, so again, this idea of how is Mother Nature providing these services and then how can we replicate that rather than the traditional heat, beat, and treat model we have now. There's a great book if you're interested in more about biomimicry by Janine Benyus that looks at how nature makes things and provides a process and some guidance about how to um, start putting this into practice when you're designing new products or processes. Okay, so we want to do this transformative innovation. We want to be able to provide this function and this service, but we want to make sure we do that in a sustainable way. And it's important to think systematically. So one of my favorite cartoons, I'm sure glad the whole is in, in our end of the boat. So we're all connected. The system, it's important that as we practice our scientific endeavors and um, carry out these exercises, which are often reductionist, so we hold all the variables constant except for one, and we study how this chemical or product or process might behave. But it's important to think about how it functions within the system, what the feedback mechanisms are, what the causal relationships are, so we can avoid those unintended consequences. So let's think about the system that we're currently in. These are some figures I pulled from Paul Kretzen, who's a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. And he defined this um, era of geologic time called the Anthropocene. So basically human dominated impact on um, the planet. So all these figures go from 1750 to 2000 and um, various parameters that he looked at. So here's population, total real GDP, 
the damming of rivers, um, water use, fertilizer consumption, the number of McDonald's restaurants, CO2 in the atmosphere, flooding. Um, and the idea is that we are living in this dynamic world. And if you notice anything about all of those figures, it's this hockey stick curve. So it's not only are these attributes increasing, but the rate at which they're increasing is increasing. So it's important as we think about doing design that that's the system we're working within. And so what solutions we put out today are going to exist in a very different world in 10 or 15 or 20 years from now, exponentially different than what we're working on today. So we need to think about the system we're in and what the lifetime expectancy of the products and processes we're designing are so that we fit within this dynamic world. So I'm going to spend a few minutes on the principles of green engineering. These are analogous to the principles of green chemistry in that there are some guidelines and a framework to think about um, in terms of uh, achieving this goal of designing more sustainable products and processes. So the first principle of green engineering is essentially green chemistry. We want to start with the most benign materials um, and chemicals and energy sources that we can, and then working from that molecular basis, how do we put these things together into products and processes and systems? So um, I'm going to go through a few of these in detail. There's a reference to the original um, paper describing the principles of green engineering at the bottom. Um, so one of the principles talks about viewing complexity as an investment. And this is really an argument for modular, standardized, upgradable design. So this is a really, again, tangible example. Um, on your upper left, you have a, a GM, again, concept car. So basically their idea here was that they were going to have this hybrid skateboard that was essentially the drivetrain for a vehicle. And then as you go through different life stages, you can see the pink, you know, kind of hot sports car and then the family truckster and then maybe your midlife crisis car. And so there's an environmental benefit to this because as you're upgrading just the parts of the car that you need to serve different functions, you're not recreating the part of the car, um, that drivetrain that's going to continue to function. There's also an economic benefit in terms of GM because once you buy into this product line, you're basically a customer for life. And so they're creating this long-term relationship as an economic win, and then there's also environmental benefit from, from pursuing this kind of strategy. Um, another great example is integrating material and energy flows. So this is a very famous eco-industrial park in Kallenberg, Denmark, where they started to look at how do we take waste streams from one facility and use those as feedstocks for another to establish these relationships. So what was once a waste is now actually valuable as a feedstock to another company. It's no longer discharged to the environment and, again, an economic gain for the company. Um, thinking about durability rather than immortality, so designing polymers that are um, degradable over time under natural or uh, expected environmental conditions. And this can be taken from polymers to lots of other molecules that we need to um, provide short-term function and then essentially want them to um, degrade in the environment into uh, non-toxic um, metabolites. Another one of the principles of green engineering talks about designing for commercial afterlife. So thinking about all those printer toner cartridges that are out there. Um, been very effective in a strategy for closed loop recycling in terms of collecting these back and refilling them with ink. Um, so if you look at uh, toner cartridge collections just from one company, again, um, year in and year out, um, uh, uh, increase in the amount of um, uh, cartridges that are coming back into the system. Toner cartridges life cycle assessment starts to see the environmental benefit if we can avoid setting these things into municipal solid waste stream, but rather setting them back for recycling and reuse. And when we reuse these products, much less recycle them, we keep our costs down significantly. So the second time cost of these cartridges is essentially zero. So again, we have an environmental benefit in terms of keeping these products out of landfills and an economic benefit to the company in terms of being able to resell the same product over and over again with increased profits. 
Um, and the last principle of green engineering talks about using renewable and readily available um, resources. And so this is everything from uh, corn-based or bio-based polymers and materials to looking at waste streams that are available within um, a reasonable distance and then incorporating those as feedstocks into your process. Um, one more example of a principle of green engineering. So I put up here a map of the United States. You'll see some red in the middle and blue on the coast. This is not a political map. This is actually a map of the hardness of calcium carbonate distributed around the United States. This becomes really important if you make laundry detergent because if you're in a place that has very hard water, you need to provide um, additional things. Historically, uh, phosphate was the builder that was used to bind this hard water so that your surfactants could function in the washing cycle. And so what happened was all of these um, laundry detergents were formulated for the middle part of the country, the hardest water conditions. But it turns out the vast majority of the population actually lives on the coast. And so we had a lot of phosphate that was included in these products that cost the companies money to put in and ship in those products, and that had environmental costs in terms of eutrophication when they weren't consumed during the wash cycle because there wasn't hard water present. So you see all these eutrophication effects. So again, designing for need rather than excess. And so did it make sense to design these laundry detergents for the harshest conditions where there were the fewest number of people? So we want to get at these leapfrog and disruptive innovations. So providing function without product. How do you do that? Um, it's not only disruptive in terms of the kind of science that we want to pursue, it's also disruptive in terms of the business model. So thinking about who's going to disrupt your, the current business model that's being pursued and can you disrupt yourself or is somebody else out there going to do it? And so um, thinking broadly not just about product innovation but also the ecosystem that surrounds that. Um, so let's talk about these disruptive or transformative innovations. So this is really ideality. We want to provide function without the product. So a really classic example of this is, you know, telephone wires that were strung um, everywhere to provide infrastructure for the function of communication. And now we see um, the um, use of cell phones. So we're getting all of that service of communication without the infrastructure that was built around it. So some other examples of this is how we typically waterproof surfaces. So again, a very common legacy um, chemical of concern that's discussed is PFOA. And so these Teflon um, or scratch guard coatings that had fluorinated chemicals of concern, but that's how we got the function of waterproofing. How do we get the function of waterproofing without a chemical or a chemical of concern that we need to worry about? And again, here's a biomimetic um, example of that, and you can look at the lotus flower and the microstructures on the surface so it's not smooth. When it rains, um, the contact angle changes, the water beads up, collects the dirt, and rolls off. And so you actually have provided the function of cleaning a surface without a chemical to do it. Um, there's lotus sand paint that's on the market today for buildings so that there's, uh, uh, the buildings are cleaning themselves during rainstorms. Another great example is coffee decaffeination, which was usually done using methylene chloride, which is a probable human carcinogen. The green uh, advance in this was doing coffee decaffeination using supercritical or liquid carbon dioxide, which is not regulated as a solvent by the FDA. This is great in terms of we took something that was um, using an organic solvent and switched it to CO2. But the function we wanted to provide here was coffee without caffeine, and what we did was design a greener process. Um, the transformative innovation here might be to grow coffee beans without caffeine in them. There are natural hybrids that have less caffeine, um, and then there's, of course, the GMO question of pursuing a strategy like this. But the real point is, how do we get the function we want, um, and what is the most sustainable way of providing that function? Um, Another example is laundry detergent. The green innovation in this space for a long time has been going to concentrated laundry detergent. Um, Walmart has encouraged this with their scorecards. 
in terms of uh, shelf space efficiency. The innovation here, again, is we didn't want to make our laundry detergent a little bit more green by concentrating it. The function we want to provide is clean clothes. And through DARPA and 21st Century Soldier, there's actually been a lot of work on self-cleaning clothes. And so are we going to disrupt um, this idea of trying to green up laundry detergent formulation? So the ideal solutions do represent leapfrog innovation, but and the but here, of course, is the leapfrog may not fit within the portfolio. So if you make laundry detergent, are you going to be the one to make self-cleaning clothes? And there might even be a desire to do that, but can you do that with the in-house staff and knowledge and expertise that's available? So one of my favorite Gilbert cartoons, since we were the engineers um, on the call. So on the left is a company with no strategy, and Gilbert doesn't know what to do. And then he's at a company with a strategy, and his answer is, we don't do that. So how do these leapfrog innovations fit and work within um, companies? And again, the innovation might not just be around the product, but around the business model as well. And then a necessary caveat is, how do we know the frog is jumping in the right direction? So some frogs are poisonous. Again, if we do innovation without a sustainability framework around it, we are uh, potentially going to create unintended consequences. And I think both Matt and Julie will talk about how we start looking at and thinking about the sustainability context for these innovations and measuring and quantifying that. And then sustainability is a process of continuous improvement. So it's important that we continue to check that we're actually improving, that the frog is actually jumping in the direction that's advancing the goals of sustainability. And um, just to set up Julie and Matt is this idea of how do we measure and think about these things, and it's important. And Albert Einstein always says it best that everything that can be counted does not necessarily count, and everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. And the point of this is that we spend a lot of time trying to come up with metrics that are appropriate for sustainability and sometimes run into the issue of, well, I can measure it so that's the right thing to manage instead of thinking about what we want to ma manage and then coming up with a way that's effective to measure it. Great. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, great overview presentation that sort of lays out the basic principles of green, chemist, uh, green engineering. Now I'm going to uh, pass control to Matt Eckelman from Northeastern University, who's going to uh, talk to us now in some very specific case studies. So, Matt, uh, you are now on, and if you um, ask me to forward the slides, I will do that for you. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you for having me, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm Matt Eckelman from Northeastern University, and uh, I'm going to go through, as uh, Joel said and, and Dr. Zimmerman set up, uh, some uh, more quantitative um, tools and case studies around evaluating green engineering and some of the principles that uh, were touched on earlier. Uh, okay, so these were the principles that were laid out, the 12 principles of green engineering, um, and some of them were talked about uh, specifically, but I wanted to put the whole list down here again um, just to remind you. Um, many of them are around uh, the actual design process, so they're uh, shortcuts, the rubrics for design that apply to many different realms and, and types of products and, and uh, projects that you might be working on. So fundamentally, they're, they're design principles. And uh, as with any design framework, you want to construct the design principles to get you where you want to go. In this case, we want clean products. We want a uh, more resource-efficient uh, system overall. And um, uh, using this design framework should produce superior products and projects, but we need to make sure that that's true. We need to follow up uh, with the framework and with specific case studies to ensure that we're getting the green uh, products and, and projects that we want to, um, and also that we're not introducing these unintended effects, this uh, whack-a-mole problem that Professor Sumner um, talked about earlier. So we need to figure out uh, if we're on the right road, um, and one of the tools that is used to do this is called life cycle assessment. Um, it's a quantitative environmental modeling tool um, that I'll uh, spend most of the time now uh, talking about. So uh, these areas of the life cycle, you can see, if you can see the cursor here, um, there's the product manufacturing here um, in the middle um, where 
many companies act, and then the supply chain of their materials back to extraction of uh, energy extraction of raw material and the 12 principles of green engineering deal mostly with these areas in manufacturing um, your products, but also in using renewable uh, feedstocks if possible and designing for a commercial afterlife over here on the waste treatment uh, processes side. Uh, but there's lots of other interconnections with many other pieces of the supply chain. These uh, interactions between energy systems and water systems and material systems, and then the overall interaction with the natural environment, which is what we're trying to safeguard with all of this. Um, so life cycle assessment is a modeling framework that looks at all of these different components of the product life cycle and how they interact with the natural environment in terms of maybe benefits, but also in terms of potential negative impacts. Okay, so what I'll um, go through today is just a brief description of life cycle assessment methods for uh, any of you who may not be familiar with them. Um, and then I'll go through a, uh, two case studies, one related to, again, the use of mercury and CFLs that Professor Zimmerman um, spoke about, and then the use of nanomaterials and electronics, so um, uh, emerging materials and electronics. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finish off with some efforts to integrate LCA metrics into green chemistry and engineering frameworks um, where I see uh, things going these days. Okay, so uh, LCA, or life cycle assessment, just in brief, again, it's a systems modeling tool, and most of us operate as consumers in this purple uh, circle, if you can see this. Um, this is where we use our products, right? We read the newspaper, we use our computers, we take the train to work. We don't have a good idea, generally, of where our products come from or where they go after we're done with them or the infrastructure that's used to um, support them in many cases. Um, and many times uh, where potential impacts are actually taking place is outside of our sphere of influence or really our sphere of consciousness. Um, so, so these environmental impacts can occur at many different parts of the life cycle and they can be quite non-intuitive uh, in many cases. Uh, all of these stages need to be considered carefully in order to make the right design or the right policy decisions to avoid these unintended uh, consequences. And again, back to this question of whack-a-mole, we want to look at multiple environmental uh, and health impacts of our products and, and uh, systems at the same time to make sure we're not just moving our burdens from one uh, compartment to another. So we solve an air pollution problem, but we make a hazardous waste problem as a, as a result of that. We want to avoid that kind of uh, uh, situation if we can. So uh, here's a quick uh, example I'll use um, to talk about LCA in general. Um, so what you see here is a fellow holding up uh, uh, the um, plug end of an electric vehicle. So this was one of Ford's concept cars, and they uh, came out with this advertisement in a couple years ago saying, uh, we'll uh, uh, deliver this fantastic car, lots of energy efficiency advantages, but zero CO2 emissions from the car. So this was billed as a green car uh, and uh, uh, a real advance in reducing uh, uh, transit-based pollution. Uh, but if you look at the whole system around supporting the operation of a car, uh, for those of you who live in Connecticut, this is the Bridgeport uh, coal-fired power plant here, uh, and this may be supplying some of the power that uh, goes into the electric grid that then is used to charge this vehicle. And so uh, the very charging and operation uh, is uh, resulting in indirect uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other types of pollutant emissions. Um, and this depends on where you are. It depends on the local electricity grid, the context of the energy system. Um, and many of the places which have highly incentivized electric vehicles let's say Germany, for example, have uh, an electric power grid that is fairly um, coal intensive. So we may be simply shifting the emissions burden from ground level end of pipe uh, from your car to uh, communities surrounding these power plants. We haven't actually reduced the overall amount. We also have to consider the other type of materials that go into making this kind of vehicle. What you're looking at now is the uh, this is a nickel cobalt battery that uh, operates this car. Uh, and uh, nickel and cobalt both are very energy intensive to mine and refine. Uh, 
And so we need to look at all of these things at the same time to really ensure we're getting a greener product overall. Um, so just a, a quick uh, brief of the steps of life cycle assessment. You have uh, uh, your life cycle in the box here. Um, so I'm talking about the materials that go into your device. Maybe they're manufactured in China, packaged up and sent to you um, to use and enjoy. Uh, and with each of these kinds of um, steps, you would count the electricity, the resources, the water, all the things that go into these uh, processes directly that you see. Um, in addition, you need to understand where all of those resources and energy and water come from. So these are called the background processes that you want to count. Uh, so uh, you can also go back uh, up the chain and uh, look at how these uh, resources are made. Um, it gets a little bit hairy. You can imagine you need the steel to run the uh, uh, power plant to make the electricity, to power your electric car, and so on. So uh, these are all uh, interconnected in, in a complex way in a network, um, often thousands of different nodes here, and you assemble these into what's called the life cycle inventory. So this is a system-wide bill of resource use and emissions. So it's not just what you use directly in your product, it's all of the things that go in to support that production and all the emissions that occur as a result of that. Um, so you take that full bill of materials, which is called the life cycle inventory, and you run it through what's called an impact assessment model, which is uh, an environmental systems model. It tracks where emissions are taking place, follows them through the atmosphere or through the waterways, sees how they transform, sees how they may um, get ingested or inhaled by humans or uh, cause some impacts in ecosystems. So you're, you're looking at this entire chain from emissions all the way down to effects on people and effects on ecosystems. And those are what we call life cycle impacts. Um, so uh, there are several different models that you can use for this. Um, one of the most popular ones here in the United States is called the Tracy model, um, which was developed by the US EPA. Uh, and they look at these types of categories of environmental impact. So this is the picture of whack-a-mole. It's not a five-headed hammer. You need here, it's more like an 11-headed hammer. Uh, so uh, just to, to look through some of these, climate change is uh, first and foremost on many people's minds, but there are many other types of environmental impacts that have very serious consequences for the environment and for health, uh, particularly around particulate emissions and other types of uh, carcinogenic and toxic releases. So we want to uh, have a model that looks at all of these at the same time, um, if we can. So I'm going to go through uh, one of the case studies now. This is a project we had uh, looking at mercury for CFLs. Um, as was mentioned, uh, all CFLs have a small amount of mercury, less than five milligrams, that allows them to um, uh, operate. And uh, uh, when we did the study, there had been a very big push uh, to put in 100 million light bulbs that year. This was 2007. Um, Walmart was tracking this. That was their goal, 100 million light bulbs. They put in 145 million light bulbs. So they were a very successful campaign um, all over the country in some states. Uh, you can see we're, we're uh, uh, very progressive in, in uh, pushing CFL sales. So uh, this has both consequences in terms of the mercury that's in bulbs, but it also has some benefits. We wanted to look at these trade-offs between benefits and consequences at the same time. So uh, CFLs take up a very small amount, actually, of the overall mercury burden of the US. So here uh, we emit a, a, just about 150 megagrams, that's metric tons per year, of uh, mercury to the atmosphere. Uh, fluorescent lamps, just about 1%. The biggest uh, percentage here is from utility boilers. So this is power plants, uh, uh, for the most part, and uh, and Reducing the power plant emissions uh, may have a, a larger benefit in some cases um, than the introduction of this mercury and CFL lamps. So this was the trade-off we wanted to look at. So uh, just to give you a sense of how we put one of these maps together, um, this is the life cycle of a fluorescent lamp, starting with mercury mining and production um, from cinnabar ore then you have CFL incandescent lamp production. Uh, so this is more of a basic material. Then you have the actual uh, product in use. 
And then you're using this product and you're affecting the electric power grid. Right? You're reducing demand through your uh, uh, efficiency in lighting. Um, and this has uh, an effect on mercury emissions. Right? If you reduce demand, uh, you need less power, you produce less power on the margin, um, and then you have uh, less emissions. Um, eventually, you throw out these bulbs and uh, they break in many cases, and you need to account for that mercury as well. So starting on the right side here, right, we were looking at the reduction in demand, how electric power grids were responding, and then where all of this coal was coming from. We wanted to look at um, the actual production and cleaning and transport of coal. Washing coal before you burn it is a very effective way of reducing mercury loading. Um, so we wanted to consider that in, in all of the states where this policy was being put in place. So you'll see now the results of the study. Um, and what you're looking at is the net reduction in milligrams of mercury from the switch of one lamp. So if I switch one lamp, what kind of effect does that have? Um, in green states, it has a very good effect because the reduction in emissions from power plants vastly dominates the actual introduction of mercury um, in the lamps themselves. So it's a net benefit overall to mercury emissions, uh, particularly in these three states, New Mexico, um, North Dakota, and West Virginia. There's some parts of the country where you don't experience a benefit, and in fact, you actually contribute a net amount to mercury emissions uh, on the West Coast and in New England in particular. Um, so these are states which may want to dial down their uh, subsidy of uh, fluorescent lamps in particular, or try to set up more robust collection systems um, so that you can reduce lamp breakage again. So uh, on the face of it, CFL seemed like an excellent way to reduce energy um, uh, use and, uh, and uh, uh, modulate our demand for resources. But we want to look at this in a system level way uh, uh, by state. So uh, having a, a policy that's tailored to location, uh, just as the fabric softener or the uh, laundry detergent was tailored to location. That's the same kind of uh, analysis we want to do here. So the second example I'll take you through is a novel technology, carbon nanotubes, used in electronics. Um, many of you uh, uh, may be doing some of this yourself. Um, so again, here's the life cycle for uh, CNT, carbon nanotube-based uh, uh, electronic device. So you make the CNTs, you put them into a device, you use them, and then you put the device into waste management system, and uh, after that, most people have no idea what happens to them. Um, and uh, and uh, Professor Schoening will tell us more about that. Um, so here we wanted, again, to look at this in a, a balanced way, system systematic way. So you have releases of carbon nanotubes from each of these life cycle stages. And then you, you need materials and energy to actually produce, to assemble these, to use the devices in many cases, and then to run your waste management systems. And the actual use of this material and energy itself produces uh, environmental impacts that have nothing to do with the CNT. They might be from particulate emissions or uh, uh, copper particulates in, in the environment, um, but they, they lead to environmental impacts. And we want to see, on balance, which impacts are dominating. Are the impacts from carbon nanotubes dominating or the impacts from making and assembling and producing and using the carbon nanotube devices actually dominate. And this will help us uh, get a good sense of where to go with R&D and with uh, regulation around nanotechnology. This is an emerging uh, class of materials, and there, there isn't a lot of um, relevant regulation at the moment. Um, so we used a particular type of life cycle model to do this. Um, and we're just looking at ecotoxicity, of course. So uh, one difficulty in, in evaluating toxicity from carbon nanotubes is they're uh, highly variable um, in their toxic effects, depending on many things, depending on chirality, so the way they're wound from sheets in order to make tubes, um, the way they're capped or functionalized with other types of uh, functional groups on their uh, uh, edges here, uh, and in their aspect ratio, in, uh, in the type of catalysts that are used to produce them, many things affect their uh, toxicity and the way they behave in the environment. Uh, so we wanted to uh, do a bounding study to capture the full range of toxicity 
possible here. Um, we also needed to figure out where they go after they get into the environment. So we made use of some work that's a, a mass balance model of carbon nanotubes in the environment. And uh, if uh, we just click one more here, um, you'll see a very small percentage of them, less than a half a percent, end up in surface waters. This is where a lot of the ecotoxic effects will take place. Um, uh, so we uh, we looked at different scenarios here um, to uh, to essentially dose surface waters with carbon nanotubes. And if you go to the next um, slide, you'll see the results of this study also. So um, on uh, on this graph, the x-axis here is a measure of ecotoxicity, uh, going to the right being bad. It's a log scale. Um, and then you see these different scenarios on the y-axis. So uh, ecotoxicity from releases of carbon nanotubes up at the top here, both a realistic case and a worst case, um, you can see um, with their associated error bar. And, um, and then below that, you see these different production scenarios. This is ecotoxicity from indirect emissions related to the nano life cycle. So this is emissions from power generation facilities that supply the electricity to run the reactor to make the carbon nanotubes and so on. And uh, what is very interesting from the results here is that the effects of producing these nanotubes are uh, orders of magnitude higher than the realistic case and on par with the worst case scenario from the ecotoxic effects of the nanotubes themselves. Uh, so what this tells us uh, is that uh, we should focus our attention on regulatory basis and also just on green chemistry and R&D basis, not just on reducing releases, uh, but also uh, on reducing these way, uh, these uh, CNTs in a, in a resource efficient, energy efficient manner to try to reduce those indirect effects that are actually dominating ecotoxicity and other types of life cycle impacts. Uh, so, uh, Nanotechnology is being introduced in many, many types of electronics now. Uh, and uh, we've gotten questions that uh, uh, basically can be summed up in this way. Should a new green engineering principle be no nanotechnology? Right, that's very energy and materials intensive to produce nanomaterials. Is it really uh, worth it to put in our products despite all the many, many um, advantages uh, technologically that they can incur. So what I want to show you is the results of a follow-up study. Um, it really depends on how the CNTs are used. So in this um, analysis, which was for a, a switch, um, an electronic switch, the effects of CNT synthesis was insignificant, very, very small percentage of uh, So just because uh, you do one of these life cycle assessments of a material does not mean at all um, that, uh, that uh, it's a universal study um, and, uh, and you still need to be very uh, uh, sensitive to the context um, where these materials are being used. Um, okay, so um, last uh, bit I'd like to uh, end with here is um, just talking uh, about the integration of green chemistry and engineering metrics and principles that um, You've seen the principles of green chemistry and the 12 principles of green engineering and the, and the way metrics work in life cycle assessment. Uh, there's some advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, so this is one of the examples from green chemistry. And if, um, if we can click in a little bit to this slide, uh, the green chemistry principles are very much about the direct use of substances. And uh, one um, group called iSustain uh, has uh, developed these metrics for different green chemistry principles. This one is around using uh, uh, inherently benign raw materials. So uh, this is good in terms of your direct inputs into your uh, synthesis or your product. Uh, it, uh, most green chemistry and green engineering uh, uh, principles uh, concentrate on uh, the design process or first tier inputs into the design process. And it's really difficult to see up the chain to look at these interconnections that happen with, uh, among materials, resources, and energy uh, uh, that lead to some of these unintended effects, which is exactly what life cycle assessment does. Um, so that's one advantage there. Um, and there have been attempts in the past to try to integrate green chemistry and life cycle assessment. Um, and you can see some of the 
uh, uh, luminaries of the field here uh, uh, putting their pen to paper on this topic. Um, LCA, on the other hand, isn't necessarily design focused, um, but it's very useful for identifying hotspots um, and uh, looking at unintended consequences, and then feeding that information back into green chemistry and green engineering uh, principles in order to guide design. Um, so one of the big uh, limitations of life cycle assessment is that uh, if you look at the units of them, uh, things only have an impact if there's an emission that is there to be tracked. So this idea of inherent hazard doesn't really exist in life cycle assessment at the moment. Right? In order for something to have uh, a, an, an actual quantitative impact in LCA, it has to be part of that life cycle inventory, that bill of materials. Um, so if something is inherently hazardous but happens not to be released at that time, um, uh, then it doesn't get counted. So zero emissions means zero impacts. And what we're trying to do now is to integrate the concept of inherent hazard, um, and especially around chemicals use, into life cycle assessment tools by going into the actual computational structure of LCA, um, which you can see in the next slide here. Um, uh, okay, sorry. Well, I'll, uh, just as an example, back to uh, the limitations of LCA. Here's a very famous uh, uh, green chemistry example for making polycarbonate. That you make it through the phosgene process, you might get some chlorine contaminated polycarbonate. You need stoichiometric quantities of phosgene, a highly um, corrosive and toxic substance. But because the phosgene itself isn't being emitted here, you essentially see zero impact from that. Um, uh, hazardous process in a life cycle assessment framework. What we'd like to do is adjust LCA to be able to account for that inherent hazard. Uh, so what we've done is to go back through the computational structure of LCA um, to alter uh, some of the uh, matrix algebra that's used. And you can just click through this part here just as a, as a illustration of, of uh, how the uh, life cycle assessment um, uh, algorithm ends up operating, um, you can essentially add a, a row here um, to the matrix and calculate a new measure of inherent hazard, uh, which isn't based on emissions. It uh, has to do with all the intermediate chemicals and uh, uh, process steps that might happen that uh, don't lead directly to uh, emissions but are, uh, have inherent hazard and potential um, occupational and uh, safety uh, implications in the case of accidents. So we want to capture this. And this is a, 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 an area of intense uh, work at the moment in the life cycle assessment community. Um, and I expect to see more metrics and, and more integration of uh, green chemistry, green engineering, and, and life cycle assessment tools in the future. Uh, so I think that's it for my side. Uh, just to wrap up here, uh, I, I, uh, I hope I've um, communicated the life cycle modeling. It's a useful quantitative analysis as a complement to the design principles of green engineering. Um, you may find indirect impacts or benefits that outweigh direct impacts or benefits, and you have to be careful about these unintended trade-offs that may occur uh, between different phases of the life cycle and between different types of environmental impacts. Um, and that there's uh, a lot of work now to integrate green engineering and life cycle assessment type um, uh, uh, frameworks to produce new tools and metrics to help the next generation of uh, product designers. Uh, so uh, thanks for uh, the invitation to speak to you again, and uh, I hope we have a, a fun uh, Q&A session afterwards. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. And with that, um, I'd like to invite uh, Julie Shonung uh, to give the last presentation. Um, well, hello, everyone, and thank you for um, your continued attention on the webinar and this opportunity to uh, share with you some of the work that we've been doing um, at, with applying green engineering principles to a variety of case studies. So what I'd like to um, cover in the time remaining is some of the work we've done. Most of it, you'll see, is focused on um, material selection within uh, various products, including electronics, uh, photovoltaics, and lighting systems. And the focus here um, 
is actually a nice dovetail from what Matt just ended with in terms of looking at inherent hazard um, within materials and within products because of the concern that um, a product that ends up in a landfill could eventually, that material could eventually become problematic or if it's handled improperly, such as in developing countries, then um, we need to assume that even though it may not be of concern to get into our environment under normal treatment, it may get into the environment through inappropriate treatment. So I want to focus here on a few techniques and examples um, where my philosophy that I reiterate often with my group and students is to try to find um, methodologies that um, allow us to make sure that we're not changing function. Engineering comes first, um, and so we want to make sure that function is retained. But see if we can uh, apply systematic, uh, hopefully transparent, decision-making tools to allow us to compare alternatives and guide better design. So echoing back to many of the things that uh, Julie Zimmerman commented on in terms of uh, we do want function, uh, we do want economic viability, um, but we also want to minimize the um, footprint overall on the environment and on human health. So with that, I'm going to talk about just uh, quickly about a couple examples of economic assessment related to electronic waste and then talk more about some of the toxicity and hazard assessments that we've done. The first case study is um, for CRTs, cathode ray tube displays, the big bulky ones that most of us don't use anymore that have been used for decades for TVs and computer displays, and um, applying a fairly established technical cost modeling approach to estimating the cost of uh, managing those products at end of life. And so this diagram just shows a, a, a system diagram of collecting those uh, CRTs at a materials recycling facility and um, basically consisting of shredding, smelting, um, melting down materials and trying to recover some value out of those products from the materials themselves. Um, so this is a slide that highlights that within the cathode ray tubes um, we have lead. So one of the issues with these products is that they contain the toxic material of lead, but they also contain valuable materials like copper and silver. And this is just a, um, <clears throat> an outline of some of one technique. There are many techniques by which you can extract the lead out of the system, um, both to keep it from getting into the environment and also to put it back into the marketplace for use. And um, without going into the details on this slide or the next, but highlighting that we want to make sure to recover copper because the uh, concentration of copper in most of our electronics tends to be higher than it is in uh, naturally occurring ore that's being processed today. And then, of course, there's additional precious metals of silver, gold, platinum, and palladium that we want to smelt out. So the study that we did on the um, materials recovery facility for CRTs uh, involved an economic assessment as well as material flow. Here I'm just looking at the um, material uh, recovery and economics and um, looking at the expenses of running the facility and then the revenue streams in pink from the material recovery itself. Um, some components could be resold ahead of time. And uh, also here in California, we have a fee uh, as part of an incentive for turning your displays back in for recycling. So there is a uh, uh, deposit that people need to put on uh, down when they buy a new display. So that's incorporated. Next slide. Um, this shows the results for the cost side of the equation and highlighting our ability to uh, evaluate the different cost drivers in the materials uh, recovery uh, facility and that in, in this case the um, recycling of the CRT itself was the most expensive component. On the revenue, uh, the fees collected from the customers are an important co contributor because the material recovery, the value of materials after you go through all that shredding and melting and um, material separation, uh, you just don't get that much back in the revenue stream, um, but at least the materials are recovered and there is some uh, economic benefit to that. 
Um, the second case study here on economic assessment is on cell phones and highlights, again, the um, importance of designing the phone maybe with a different intent in mind from the beginning. And in this case, it's to think about disassembly. Uh, a cell phone is a much more complex product than the CRT was. And as you can see here, again, we have the life cycle stages across the top, the um, industry players across the bottom, and then the large variety of materials on the uh, left box um, that feed into making all the different components in a cell phone. Now, the study was done in 2006. So it was back in the era of a, sort of a flip phone technology, um, not a touch screen uh, smartphone that we have today. Um, and then uh, all the components that go into that uh, are highlighted in the box on the right. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is a schematic of um, highlighting the idea of wanting to be able to take out components. And obviously that presents also the um, industry design challenge of can you reuse the components? And at the time when the study was done, there were several um, companies that were entrepreneurial new startups that were moving forward towards recovering um, uh, components both out of cell phones and computers and getting them back into the mainstream and back into um, newly manufactured products. So it was indeed um, another example of that industrial ecology of taking components out of obsolete products and putting them back in. Um, so in this particular uh, phone, the bill of materials, as was mentioned earlier, is not really materials. It's a bill of components. And um, the components that go into this particular case study, the cell phone um, had over 600 parts. And the study that we did was to look at the size, weight, complexity of the phone, how you could take it apart um, and get revenue out of that. And the results uh, are summarized here in three pie charts. Um, the top two are uh, focused on the disassembly analysis, where on the left side, um, the assumption is that there is a malfunction in the phone. And so most of the revenue comes from material recovery, just as we had uh, assumed for the CRT displays. Um, but on the right-hand side, um, in the case where we had a good condition phone that could be um, dismantled and put back into um, products, um, you get, I want you to focus on the dark blue sliver at the top. That's from the printed circuit board. And that's basically equivalent to the large slice of the pie on the left-hand diagram. So the, the revenue from the disassembled um, phone when it's in good condition is also um, uh, significantly you know, orders of magnitude higher. Um, and then the third pie chart at the bottom just reflects the uh, initial materials cost, which not surprisingly echo quite uh, well with the material value that you can get if you just um, crush it and recover materials um, from most of the components. Um, so the next case study I want to look at is um, looking at ha hazard and toxicity potentials in uh, utility meters. And here we looked at four components that are manufactured by a company uh, called Reotronics, located in Colorado. And they came to us eager to figure out how to take hazardous substances out of their products. Um, they were willing to share with us their bill of materials, which is always an important uh, set of information that we need in order to do this type of assessment. And so again, their bill of materials started with um, a list of components, and the components for one of the um, products is, are listed here across the x-axis. And then we went further working with them and doing basic material analysis uh, to identify what type of material, and here they're just broken down into category of material, but we looked more specifically at actual material within um, each component. And we used a um, methodology called the Toxic Potential Indicator that was developed by our colleagues at Fraunhofer Institute in Berlin. And we chose this method for characterizing um, the toxicity potential of each of the materials in these products 
because we could get um, a numerical score from 0 to 100, and each material would have um, a unique score um, based on these three attributes of occupational exposure limits, um, water hazard classification, and then what the Germans call risk phrases. So the first one captures the human health. The second one is their uh, effort to capture uh, ecological health. And then the third one is um, physical hazard. So they called them risk phrases. It's not risk in the context that, of a human health risk assessment, but rather physical hazards such as um, irritants to the eye or corrosive or flammable. So um, Fraunhofer developed this methodology with various um, logic streams and aggregation so that you could get a score here from 0 to 100, 0 being preferred. Um, but we took this TPI scoring method one step farther, and that was to um, apply it in two ways. One of the debates about toxicity or hazard is whether or not it's appropriate to do a sum-weighted um, uh, evaluation. Um, most toxicologists and public health experts will argue against that methodology because it dilutes the um, substances with high hazards like lead or mercury or cadmium. And um, so their argument is often just to try to identify those high hazard or high toxicity materials. So we did two scenarios. We did it both as a sum weighted average, which engineering designers tend to be more comfortable with. And we did it with what we called a max component um, approach, which was to say the component score was based on the highest impact material. We also did um, sensitivity analysis um, because we knew that our material compositions had some uncertainty and our TPI scores had some uncertainty. So that gave us a total of four scenarios to compare or rank the components that presented the greatest challenge in terms of toxicity and hazard. And for the pulse point product, um, you can see the five rankings for the four different scenarios listed here. Um, within the study, we went in to identify alternatives to the substances that target triggered these components, but that's beyond what I wanted to cover here today. Um, for the thin film photovoltaics, or uh, SIGs, we were looking at um, a novel technology for solar cells. Um, Julie Zimmerman presented at the beginning a uh, slide of solar cells and uh, photovoltaic uh, fields growing up uh, within the countryside. And um, SIGs is a, a fairly new technology, unlike the silicon technology that most of those uh, solar panels are currently made out of, and has the um, benefit of potentially being thin film, um, therefore being flexible. The um, SIGS is a semiconductor uh, layer that is your primary uh, photovoltaic, and it consists of copper, indium, gallium, and either sulfur or selen selenium. Um, the SIGS um, product has many layers to it, um, starting with the substrate at the bottom of this diagram, and then several layers, and then uh, the SIGS lands in the middle, um, below a buffer layer, another oxide um, conducting layer and uh, that needs to be transparent or a window, and uh, then the encapsulant at the outer layer. And our goal here was to um, identify the materials that would um, end up in the final product. Uh, so these are some of the examples here of the key materials that um, would be in the product depending on the design of the actual um, entire photovoltaic cell. Um, we also wanted, however, to look at the process, so a bit of the life cycle being in, encompassed in this study because this is a new technology. So unlike what we've studied in the other ones where it's existing product and commercialized, this is only at the incubator stage. I mean, there is some commercial viable processes, but it's not widely used yet. And so we were interested in looking at um, comparing laboratory methods for making these, um, all of the layers that I showed in the previous diagram, 
and um, identifying, providing guidance on whether or not these laboratory methods lead to um, using substances both in the process and that end up in the final product that are um, higher or lower hazards. So as um, Julie presented earlier about really needing to make decisions early in the design process, um, this was kind of the goal in this study was to highlight um, what our laboratory methods, which have a very important purpose, which is to improve the efficiency of the solar cell, but to um, balance that with if we're moving towards higher efficiency, it'd be nice if we're also moving towards um, using substances that are not more toxic than the industry standard. So um, for each of the um, layers in the module, we did this analysis. To do this, we used two tools. One was TPI, which I presented on the uh, Reotronics components, and the second is a tool called Green Screen for Safer Chemicals, which is a um, methodology developed by Clean Production Action, uh, a non-government organization. It is uh, publicly available um, on their website. It's uh, one of the most transparent and easy to use. Even the TPI is, is not transparent. There's some logic in there that um, I didn't explicitly go over today. Um, but here in green screen, the focus is to um, be unified or um, consistent with um, the relatively new United Nations Globally Harmonized System for Chemical Labeling, um, the, or GHS. And it's also fairly well harmonized with the US EPA's Design for Environment um, methodology. And it focuses on using these um, 17 hazard traits to um, uh, characterize or evaluate um, the, a, a given substance and its byproducts. Um, and so you can see that they're broken into categories. The priority human health effects, of course, include um, the main ones of whether it's a carcinogen, a mutagen, or a reproductive toxin, as well as some others. And then we have additional human health effects, um, such as eye and skin irritation. Ecotox is accounted for, environmental fate is accounted for, although in our study we did neglect persistence because the metals are all persistent, so that um, makes them uh, highly hazardous regardless of anything else. And then we also have um, other uh, physical hazard traits. So one of the things about green screen um, that I like as a material selection uh, person is that those 17 hazard traits can be quantified and compared in the same way we would quantify and compare other functional attributes or performance attributes like strength, ductility, melting point, et cetera. And so sometimes we use it just as raw data. But the green screen approach also has a, um, a decision framework built into it. And that decision framework um, has been vetted by a group of experts from toxicology all the way through industry practitioners and um, creates a, a logic by which um, you can translate those 17 hazard traits into these four benchmarks where benchmark ones are things that um, companies want to avoid or not use, and benchmark two is a little bit better, benchmark three is better yet, and benchmark four is um, really a, a safer chemical, things that we would prefer to use. So we used this methodology and went through um, their framework, their decision-making logic, and determined benchmark scores for all the substances in the SIGS technology. This is an example for cadmium sulfide. And there's a, some animation here. And put in scores for each of those 17 attributes. Um, you see that there is um, a high hazard in the priority health effects with two of the traits in that category. There's also a medium hazard for um, and a high hazard for human health effects on, that gets you to a benchmark two. But because of the red boxes in the um, human health, the high priority human health, that leads to a benchmark one. Mainly, this is a known carcinogen. Um, it's also a neurotoxin and 
becomes a chemical of concern or a benchmark one. So um, skipping a lot of steps for all of the chemicals, and this is just one example of one layer within the SIGs, we were able to identify that um, for this particular case, the industrial process is relatively low hazard um, compared to some of the laboratory processes, in particular the one at the bottom, the electrodeposition, has um, a significantly higher frequency of materials that are needed um, that are of high concern. So this is one way before designing materials or processes um, that we can utilize to um, take those hazards out or at least really stop and think, do we need to use this particular chemical? Do we need to use this particular chemical process? Um, could we possibly use one of the other techniques or a different chemical instead? So it's a good, it is designed as a screen. It is green screen and it is a screening tool to identify substances that maybe don't uh, we don't want to have either in our processes or our products. Um, the last case study I want to talk about, and I'll go through this uh, fairly quickly, is um, looking at light emitting diodes, both as the small diodes for electronic um, lighting as well as for artificial lighting. So a little bit of a, a circle back into CFLs from the perspective of hazard and toxicity potential. So for this study, uh, for the small diode LEDs, we did these um, eight different, uh, nine different diodes, of uh, different colors, different intensities to identify what um, substances might um, were within them. Next slide. Likewise, um, we did um, three bulbs um, with equivalent lighting capability, an incandescent, a CFL, and an LED bulb. And I want to highlight um, that, as has been stated previously, the energy savings is substantial. And if you look at the first line in the table for a CFL bulb, and even more so for an LED bulb, which is why um, regulators uh, sustainability folks were all moving towards pushing for LED lighting. Um, the lifetime of the bulbs is also significantly increased, so that means that you don't need to replace them as often. And um, But I want to highlight the last line, and that is the difference in material um, needed. The LED bulbs are heavy. Uh, incandescent bulbs are light. They have almost no substance, just the glass and the filament. Um, but LED bulbs need to have um, um, a heat sink in order for the semiconductor to continue to function. And so in our study here, our focus is not to say not to use LED bulbs. We know they're energy efficient and that's good for the environment. But we are trying to motivate here for less material consumption in the LEDs to design them in a way that they don't need to use so much material and in particular use materials that create environmental um, hazard. So the studies we did, uh, we wanted to figure out what um, content we had of different materials that are considered substances considered hazardous both by the US EPA and by California standards. So this slide is the TCLP results, which is the EPA hazardous waste uh, guidelines. And you see that for the small LEDs, the diodes, um, there um, is negligible uh, content of most substances by this. We, there was one that had lead that we think was pre ross uh, for California, however, there's um, standards for more substances or thresholds, and so by these thresholds, uh, most of these diodes would be considered hazardous waste here in the state of California. Uh, so that's one finding. The other finding is that um, this gives us our bill of substances, if you will, our uh, mass concentration of each substance so we can do toxicity potential characterization. Uh, for the bulbs, um, again, for the U.S. Uh, EPA, uh, lead was the only substance that really came up for both the CFL and the LED. And for the bulbs, even in the state of California, only copper and zinc and uh, lead were above the threshold. Mercury is there, but it's just below the um, designated threshold for hazardous waste. 
And then skipping many, many pages of results, this is just to highlight a summary of um, what we found. Taking into account the different lifetimes of these materials, um, we find that the um, from several different methods, so we're using some life cycle based methods in the resource depletion. We're using the use talks that um, Matt had used for his CNT study, and then we're using um, TPI and other toxicity potentials. And if you set in the incandescent bulb as your uh, normalization factor, the LEDs um, uh, are about two to three times worse uh, in environmental impact, because, mostly because of their material um, content. And the CFLs, because of some of those additional materials, uh, um, lead, zinc, mercury in uh, high concentrations, just uh, significantly worse for the environment from these um, metrics. So in conclusion, and barely in time, um, I just want to highlight that the environmental human health impacts of our engineered products um, can be reduced if we apply green engineering principles, especially if we apply them early in the design process. Um, there are various techniques that have been highlighted here, um, and the key is really to make this part of the design process. It shouldn't be an extra step. It should just be an integral step in designing processes and designing products for uh, use for end of life, for dismantling, et cetera. So thank you very much for your attention, and I uh, hope this has been helpful and um, happy to answer questions. Great. Thank you so much, Julie and uh, Matt and uh, Julie Zimmerman. Uh, we have about five to ten minutes for questions right now. Um, we do have one question I want to ask all of you, and uh, it, it relates to um, turning, you know, what you've been talking to actually into um, evaluation and improvement of materials and products. Um, you all three are academics. How does this then translate into how a, a company can think about its own product design processes to integrate the principles of green engineering into their own design and some of the, you know, Julie, you sort of alluded to this uh, shunning at the end is really this is about identifying places where you can improve and reduce the impact at the design phase. So can each of you um, talk about that a little bit more of, you know, how do we take these very nice models and, and assessments and then actually turn them into better products? Sure. Um, this is Shainan, and I think, um, I think that industry uh, is making significant progress in engaging in um, changes. I think, you know, as academics, um, it's easy for us to step back and say, you should, you should, you should, but without always being in the middle of the real decisions and the decisions that need to be made quickly. Um, I think that the um, there's more and more of our students coming out who speak the language of green engineering and green chemistry. And I always uh, tell my students, I said, you know, the, you're the seed. Um, when someone asks you to do something and you think that sustainability is not being fully accounted for, uh, it'd be good if you speak up and say, we need to, um, you know, also account for this, this, and this, and at least try to do our best. So I, I see that the, the culture and in industry is changing, and I, I a little more slowly the culture in the academic world is changing. Great. Uh, Julie Zimmerman, Matt, what are your thoughts on that, that question of how this can be used in the, the, the actual industrial design application process? Um, this is Julie Zimmerman. I, I mean, I think it is being used in a lot of places, maybe not systematically, maybe not for every product, but there's certainly um, examples of um, these kinds of principles being applied in the design phase. I think some of it is running some of the analyses that Matt and Julie talked about at the design phase before you have a prototype, before you have a design, and then you're trying to figure out how to make it greener, is actually use this um, as a decision tool about which 
products you're going to take forward. Um, I think there's a lot of um, argument around, you know, making the business case for this or even for green chemistry. I think there's a lot of analogies there. I think some of the green engineering works a little bit easier because um, usually the low-hanging fruit is around efficiency, which is a very easy economic win. It's all harder when you get closer to these green chemistry questions of inherent hazard and toxicity um, or some of the work that um, Matt was talking about, about around life cycle costing. So this might be an economic win, but, you know, where is the boundary about who's going who's gonna to re uh, recoup some of that revenue? Um, so I think, and I tried to talk about this a little bit, it's not just about product innovation, but it's about innovating around the business models we're using, how we're doing financing, how we're doing valuation. So I think the whole system needs to continue to evolve. Yeah, I'd like to agree with um, Julie there. I, I see more and more use of these types of uh, principles and, and uh, assessment tools um, actually integrated in design packages. So um, from my perspective in a civil engineering department, all of the CAD programs that our students learn and that they uh, uh, then use in professional practice and, and those that we see in engineering firms and architecture firms um, are uh, incorporating these modules on material selection and, and so you can actually go and design a building and change out you know certain materials or even down to the level of coatings and finishes and look at uh, how it affects overall building uh, performance with the integration of these life cycle uh, uh, inventory data um, so the results of all of this work around assessment are now being folded back into design tools that people are using all the time um, I'd also uh, uh, have noticed that the people that put together um, certifications, um, which is a very popular uh, uh, way of differentiating products in the market and, and, uh, and driving change for, from you know materials all the way up to buildings and infrastructure, uh, a lot of those uh, certification procedures rely on uh, green chemistry and green engineering principles and life cycle assessment principles and sometimes quantitative results. So you have to meet a certain level of performance to get your, you know, lead platinum building or whatever it is. Um, and this has uh, this has really pushed the uh, introduction of these kinds of design frameworks into professional practice. Great, thank you. And let me ask one last question for those of you uh, still on the webinar. If you do have additional questions, you can um, email us at the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council and we'll be able to get responses into the new Green Chemistry Education portal that we are posting um, in the coming months on the GC3 website. As a last question, um, these are educational webinars for people in firms, um, you know, what, what do you think are the main takeaways that, that someone in various different job categories in a firm should be pulling away from a webinar like this about the, the principles of green engineering and the tools of green engineering so they can bring it back in and begin communications within their firms to advance um, more sustainable products? Uh, this is Julie Shainung. Um I think one of the things that's important is to um, not get caught up in um, what we know are limitations of methodologies and to recognize that different tools, different methods um, might provide different answers and um, that it's to recognize that all, all, to focus on the principles first. Um, that you know, we we want innovation, we want change, we want change with a conscious understanding of um, what our boundaries are, what our impacts are. Um, what we have found is that yes, we can quantify and compare alternatives using some of these methods. But the real value usually comes in just getting the data that, you know, when you go through the data and you start finding that, um, you know, we're using a handful of materials that are carcinogens and we didn't realize it, or we find 
that one particular process step that's really um, inefficient in its energy usage or that material is being thrown away or that we're using material that is extremely rare. And some of those, it, you know, very preliminary data findings are sometimes more um, relevant and easier to respond to than going through the full analysis. Um, you know, as academics, we'd like to go through all of that, and practitioners don't always have that time. And so sometimes it's just finding those low-hanging fruit, finding those nuggets of, wow, is that really true about our process? Does that really, is, are we really using that? Are we really depending on this source? Are we really, you know, some of those wow moments, I think, is, um, important to realize is just as valuable as going through a full LCA or a full hazard assessment. Great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Julie Zimmerman and Matt, thoughts on that? Hi, this is Julie Zimmerman. Um, I would agree with what Julie just said, and I tried to emphasize this a little bit. I think we need to think about what we want to measure and then how to measure it and not necessarily, I feel like a lot of the companies that um, we do work with, it's a little bit of the tail wagging the dog because something's easy to quantify or measure like e-factor or efficiency and some of these other tools are more complicated and require dealing with the supply chain. Um, that we wind up missing kind of the bigger picture. I think, as Julie said, there's a lot of value just in going through the process of, you know, who are the suppliers to the supplier and what risks or liabilities you're carrying forward, um, having access to this data, and then um, being able to use it throughout the process, um, whether it's in-house or upstream with the supply chain, and then being able to report that to, you know, businesses that you're selling to or to consumers. Um, so, again, I think it's, you know, seeing the value in this, not just for the end goal of a greener product or greener chemical, but the larger value to the company of going through the process. Great. And, Matt, you get the last word. All right. So, uh, I'd echo everything both of the Julie's have said and note that there are many more um, tools that are available to practitioners now than there used to be. Uh, many of them are in the public domain, um, and they have a, a, a history of use and improvement and, um, and uh, have been, in some cases, uh, uh, developed by other practitioners and shared with the wider community. So uh, it's, there's, there's uh, uh, many more options um, to get into this uh, for practitioners who would like to, um, and so the, the cost and the kind of, uh, intellectual uh, uh, capital needed to, to uh, do one of these analyses or go through a redesign using green engineering principles uh, it's a lot more affordable than uh, it, it may have been uh, before. So it's, it's a good time is what I'm trying to say. Great. Thank you very much. I want to thank our three speakers, uh, Julie Zimmerman, Matthew Eckelman, and Julie Shannon, uh, again for their uh, very insightful presentations, and I'd like to thank you once again for joining us today and to have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you.